everyone, and welcome to the Meticulous Moments podcast, where we facilitate community upliftment through leadership development. Now, this is season three, episode two, and it has been quite the journey thus far. I have met the most amazing people, uh, professionals out there. I have grown personally and professionally, and this podcast has brought so much love and light to the world, connected so many people. It has been such an honor. I want to thank every single guest who has been on Meticulous Moments before. Thank you for the importation of your knowledge and thank you for your support. We appreciate your support. This year we have big things coming. The two words I chose, the two power words this year is influence and impact. And we want to really influence uh, the community out there uh, to bring positive upliftment. And also we want to bring impact. We want to connect those dots. We want to connect those people and we are super excited for the journey. Now, today I'm here with a wonderful friend of mine, and his name is Rick Manning, and we are very excited to have him as a guest on the show. Also, shout out to Richard Jones, John G. Paul, Silvio Simak. I'm sure uh, there's many more that we also know um, in our networks. But Rick, before we get started, welcome to Meticulous Moments season three, episode two, and please explain to the audience who you are. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi, I'm Rick Manning. I'm a Welsh um, stunt coordinator based in South Wales uh, in Newport, and I've been in the film industry now for for, uh, over 20 odd years. Um, I've been running uh, my own stunt team, um, Patrick Bates stunt team, for about five, six years now, and Richard Jones and uh, Dom, Dom G. Paul um, are part of my team. So. Fantastic. And your team, explain to the audience what your team name is. I think that's a wonderful name that you chose. Yeah, the team's called um, Passion Blades, so the combat team. There we go. Hang on. There we are. And uh, yes, it, it's, it, I, I, I chose Passion Blades because it's, it's, it's when you have two swords clashing. You get sparks from these blades, so we call them flashing blades. Uh-huh. I think that's a very appropriate name, Rick. I think that's a the good a good name that you chose. You know, I remember interviewing John G. Paul. I remember the interviews that I do. You know, and there's always things that stick out. And I remember when I interviewed John G. Paul, he was talking about flashing blades. And I also know that Richard Jones mentioned you. In, in his interview and you know before we get started into what you do and how you started doing it tell the audience a little bit about your child and what was it like growing up for you well i was born in 1968 um, ooh, I'm <laughs> um yeah born in 1968 in a, in a uh, small town called uh, cum bran um which in welsh means by the other crow and uh yeah, I've, I've had a, you know, a, uh, I'm the youngest of, of, of five children. Uh, my father worked hard for a living. You know, we never had lots of money, but we always had, you know, good summer Christmas time and sort of, you know, birthdays and whatnot. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people um, who, who do the sort of things that we do uh, get, get bullied in school as well. So I, I was one of the ones that, that, that was generally bullied in school, you know, because I didn't have fancy clothing and I didn't have... The wonderful stuff, right? So you know, so that that, that led me on then to to I said this you know, to, to self defence and something like that as well. So you know, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. You know, it's wonderful to to look back. I always um, in the interviews, I always look back at the things that people went through in their childhood and how it really shaped them and helped them to become uh, successful in life and determined in life and. You know, very inspirational to other people. And I love, love, love hearing um, how people developed and how they faced those obstacles in life and how they really reached the pinnacle of their career, the pinnacle of reaching their goals and their dreams. And I want to ask you, you know, with you uh, moving into the industry that you are, how did you come about getting into, you know, starting Flashing Blades, working on the sea, uh, on the sets of, I know you worked on a set with Mel Gibson for Braveheart. You know, you've done some pretty cool things. How did you get to that place? Well, uh, my background is battle reenactments. Um, I've got a fascination with um, the first century uh, BC and first century AD, um, Celts, Romans, and so on. Yeah. So uh, I took part in a... Um, 
in a, a play that was taking part in, in a local castle. Um, there was advertising and a lot of people, people wanted to take part in a, in a play about the, um, a guy called William Marshall who built um, one of the founders of, of a place called Chefs of Castle. And I turned up and, and took part in this play and I ended up then, um, uh, meeting up with a, a reenactment group. And uh, a couple of reenactment groups and they, they got involved with working on um, on, on, on the film Brave Art. Originally, we, we were just there as, um, you know, background artists and so forth, you know. But the, um, I, I won't mention any, any names of the people who were involved in this, but um, the, I, I was, uh, the sound coordinator came up to me and said, uh, you know, I'll be watching you. And uh, I, I, I remember Team A and Team B. I, I didn't know what, what Team A and Team B was. Discovered then that Team A was, was closer to the camera and Team B was, was further away from the camera. So times going on, I remember doing more and more fancy routines and, and stuff with swords, whatever. And then I ended up and just, just generally um, performing stunts on it. So you know, it was a big pleasure, you know. Uh, it kind yeah. of developed. Yeah, it developed into that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. It's been in the right place at the right time, um, as I said, you know. Um, now, now, there's a, lots of reenactment groups involved in that film as well, just, just a pad, pad a bit, whether they're squaddies there and all sorts of like, yeah, but, um, you know, I, I mean, a, a bit of sword knowledge helped as well with it, you know, so, you know, and then patterns and routines were, were uh, again, imagine you doing cattles, but basically patterns and routines, you know, so, yeah, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the growth, you know, that's the growth at taking it starting from one place and really developing and growing into someone else and something else. And I think that's a part of our our life. You know, it's a part of our journey. We have to develop personally and professionally. Now, I've met amazing people, as I've mentioned before, and I have to say, each of them imparted something into my spirit, into my mind. You know, so they've imparted that knowledge so that I can also be better. And, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of people that work on movie sets. I speak to a lot of actors and producers and stunt coordinators. Uh, for instance, like John G. Paul. And what I love about what all of us do during these projects is that we enjoy what we do. We have this tremendous happiness that flows through us to other people, that hope and that that joy that we spread. So, you know, I, I talked to John G. Paul yesterday on a 10-minute little clip about New Beginnings, and he was mentioning there, and you'll see it because I'm going to post it next week. He said uh, he's getting ready to be set a light soon on a set, on a movie set, you know, and he'll send me the, the footage. I don't think people realize just how hardworking um, actors and stuntmen and women are. It's a long day on the set. It's many hours. It's a lot of takes over and over to, again to get that perfect shot. So tell me about what it's like for you to be on set. What's one of your favorite moments that you had on set on your journey? Well, again, um, John G. Paul, he, he's one of my one of my learners as such and uh, um, I'm running a, a, a stunt class now at the end of this month which is a um, Burns class or, or a film via class so I, I, I'm hoping that I attend that class so yeah so it'll be his first we're doing a half burn which is basically all the, all the back and both arms back and both legs so all being well hopefully you know, if he turns up wherever he'll be, he'll be set on fire yeah but, but yeah, but but we're, we're working on on. Um, I, I, I work with some big actors. I work with um, Daniel Mays. I work with um, Mel Gibson. I worked work on um, on Gladiator. You know, I worked on on the TV series Merlin. Um, but that was all all as performers. And uh, over the years, you know, as I, I, I broke off from being a performer, as I said, I've gone on my own end to be uh, a coordinator. You know, gone through the necessary training and so like that. You know, worked. Alongside uh, professional stunt coordinators, and so like that, you know, um, for many years, whatever, and yeah, so I, I decided then to, to, to go on my own. Mm -hmm. But seeing somebody forming a stunt that, that I that I coordinated or whatever, um, being be a sound fire, for example, you know, it, it's it's and knowing that person safe is the 
to me the important thing of it all, you know. Um, now, there are some, some, some you know, uh, some dangerous things of you, I said, like doing cards or setting fire to things, whatever. Um, being used on, on, on joke wires and some that. So, to make sure then that, that all this, these people who are doing the performances um, understand what's going on. Um, I did a, a stunt back a couple of years ago on, on a film where they wanted someone hung and uh, they, they, they were dropped. But the, the person wasn't prepared or, or wasn't trained. So that person uh, freaked out and, you know, you know uh, and then passed out because they, they, they weren't ready for ready to be for what happened. And that was all to do with, with production because they didn't give me any time to rehearse with the person. They didn't give me any time to, you know. So then you have to then look at that from a, um, a professional point of view and walk away if it were, because, you know, people don't understand that they that what we're trying to do is, is just keep it safe, you know. Very good. Yeah, that's very true. Um, you know that people, I don't think they always realize all the detail that go into producing, uh, you know, all the logistics that have to come together to make that movie good and to also keep the um, actors and the stunt men and women safe. And it's a huge responsibility to take on. And yet I feel that it's worth it, Rick, because, you know, these movies, I've watched so many movies before, and they've spoken to me on a heart level. They have uh, healed some of inner, uh, you know, wounds that people have. I know there are uh, different genres of movies out there. I mean, a drama can speak to someone. A comedy can help someone, you know, uh, feel better or, or maybe click that something is going to be okay. And... All these genres are so special that, you know, what we do out there in the film industry really is leaving a legacy. It's leaving, it's really something lasting. And uh, I commend all the actors that I work with and the stunt men and women because it's a, it's a tough uh, industry. It's a tough job to do. It's a, it's a draining job to do. But I know there is personal um, edification for each person that's involved as well, and so it is with also with martial arts. You know, it's it's a it's a tough art to study, yeah. and it's a it's a lifelong journey, just like movie making is. And I want to ask you about your martial arts. You know, what connection have you had to martial arts, and how did you enjoy that? Well, um, I originally started out learning a uh, Shotokai karate um, with a. Japanese instructor called uh, Harada, and uh, he actually um, developed Shotokai from Shotokan. Um, the stance for Shotokai was, was higher than, than, than the Shotokan stance, um, and we did a lot more uh, body, a lot more free flowing stuff. Um, and and uh, whilst I was learning to do um, uh, Shotokai karate, uh, I, I was watching. Um, Aikido and, and, and uh, as well. So I then attended a class um, in my in my local town um, with a, a called uh, John Lee. So I turned up to this class and uh, th th this John Lee was, was just wearing a high vis jacket, a pair of jeans, and, uh, and a pair of steel toe cap boots. And I didn't know who the instructor was at the time. So I walked in and said, uh, "For John Lee, he's he, he I'm John Lee." I said, "Well, where's your key?" He said, uh, "Well, I, I, I teach people to defend themselves." He said. This way, he said, because you can't get yeah, to go on and get, get the gear on. So he, he studied how people fight in the streets. He studied how, how people, um, uh, you know, you can't defend yourself, he said, uh, you know, in, in a gym the same way you can in the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, you know yourself, uh, what are you doing to me in that ball with the gear on and something like that, you know, and barefoot? It's totally different uh, doing it. When you're wearing working clothes or something, or when you're wearing, you know, um, jeans or something, or t-shirts or something, you know. So yeah, yeah. Very good philosophy the man had. He said he he um, uh, he would study people. He spent uh, days and days. I think it's about two years. He said he studied what what are people fighting. I said nightclubs, you know, and he yeah. discovered fighting outside outside nightclubs totally different to fighting the martial arts. You know, totally different. So he he developed a system where. His philosophy was is not to be there. Mm. So he said, 
the defences to walk away. Let's form the defences, not be there, you know. Yeah. And if we have to use it, then fair enough. But, you know, we said, you know, you, you see all giving all this stuff, and, not, and he said, well, don't just walk away. You know? Yeah. Possibly. I agree. I absolutely agree with him. I actually said to someone, I think it was yesterday, or maybe last week when I did, uh, you know, another recording, I said, when we go into the arts, we learn all these skills and we know we can handle the situation, but the, the true martial artist is the one that try and dissolves the situation and he's, he or she is the one that walks away. Um, exactly. Because we don't, we know how to fight, we know how to handle conflict, but we don't want to engage. And it's very true what Mr. Lee said, Sensei Lee said, because uh, dojo fighting doesn't always work in the street. And you have to be ready to defend yourself if need be, you know, if you can't get out of the situation. So valuable lessons coming from him right there. The art really does change a person. I know for me personally, Rick, uh, the martial arts helped me to find myself. And it helped me to rediscover my personal power so that I can take that part of myself into my personal and professional life and, you know, develop. And with you, I see that development. I see that growth through your whole journey. I mean, you are doing exceptional things out there. You are really changing the world in a positive manner. The people that you connect with, you know, they are absolutely so valuable. And I want to ask you, you know, we uh, we have um, victories in our lives and we have disappointments. And if I can ask you this question, um, you know, a two-sided two question, but the first side would be, before we discuss the next one, the opposite thereof, what was a huge victory? in your journey and it can be personal or professional that you celebrated well as i said it's it's it's, it's the, the um the recognition if it makes sense um i'm not saying in a in a statistical way but the recognition of of what i can do it makes sense um, um you know i said there's, there's a lot of people uh, out there who um would Class themselves as, as a, a, a whatever. You can call yourself anything you want to, but you've got to be able to back it up. You know, mm -hmm. I've met people who, who call themselves martial artists. I've, I've met people who said they're, um, um, you know, uh, black belts or whatever, and they've been beaten up because, you know, they can't what they've been saying. So it's taken me a, a long time, I said, to, to get a, um, recognized for what I do. And I've taken a lot of knocks and a lot of falls, a lot of, um, you know, people uh, ditching me, a lot of people, you know, not, um, uh, what's the word, um, trying to uh, beat it on me or whatever, or people trying to, you know, say, say that you can't do it or whatever, you know. But my perseverance and, and my constant battle to, to, to get where I am to a certain degree, you know, I'm, I'm still not world famous, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm recognised. And that's a... My personal game, my, my personal achievement, you know. Yes. That's a fantastic victory to celebrate. And you can also celebrate, <laughs> you mentioned it, perseverance. You can celebrate the fact that even though there were many things coming at you, you know, against you, and many people that maybe didn't always believe in you, you never gave up. You just kept going and you kept believing. Now, uh, disappointments on the other side of the coin, you know, I've suffered so many disappointments as well. And I have the same tenacity, you know, that you do. Uh, disappointments, I always tell people, someone asked me one time, they said, what is your superpower? It was an in, in a live TV show that I was on. I think it was E360 TV. And I said, well, if I had to choose a superpower, it would be that I'm thick skin." Because I was in the ministry for 15 years. And, you know, as a pastor, you have to be thick-skinned. You cannot uh, emotionally react to every whim of every person that you work with or every person that you attempt to help. So disappointment-wise, you know, we've suffered disappointments before. And we have um, picked ourselves up from that. We've learned the lesson and it's made us better. So... Tell me, if you had to choose a superpower, what would you super, your superpower be? Well, again, it's uh, very similar to yours. Um, thick skin, I suppose, is a degree, because 
I've been let down by uh, lots of people in the past as well. You know, people I've trusted, people that I've, 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 um, you know, uh, talk, talk to personally about, about personal things. You know, yeah. and then finding out then that um, uh, only only want you there, only want you when it benefits them. Doesn't make sense, you know. And I was like, well, you know, I don't quite understand the the the, the, the mental. Um, Thoughts that go through their heads, but unfortunately, you know, if you get up, dust off down, and carry on, you know. So it's, uh, but yeah, so it, it, it's 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 been able to to handle the again the, the criticism, being able to handle the, you know, the, the, the people saying you can't do that, you can't do that, you know. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we have to be like that in this industry. And I I think back over so many success stories, and a lot of those people would never have achieved and attained the things that they have if they had to lend out their ear and listen to others' opinions. So I want to speak to the audience and say, you know, look at Rick's life. There were many things that he had to face, but he never gave up. And you do the same. You believe in your dream. You keep on going. You finish that goal. You keep that vision uh, this year, Rick, at Meticulous Moments, we are going to focus a lot on new beginnings because our sponsor is New Beginnings Motivation. And a new beginning for me was in 2020 when my mom passed away and from a stage four brain cancer. She was diagnosed uh, during the lockdown. They didn't realize that there was something wrong. They thought she had an ear infection, a middle ear infection. And they gave her three weeks to live. And we were going to be on lockdown for three weeks. And I was living at that time nine hours away from her residence, a nine-hour drive. And I remember sitting at the end and the, at the foot of my bed every day. The sun would come in at a certain time. And I would look over at the mountain. We're on lockdown. We can't go anywhere. And I would pray every day. And I would say, Lord, I ask you two things. I, I said, I prayed, I said, Lord, if you can just help me to see her before she passes, make her last longer. Um, I know it's inevitable. I make peace with that. And the second thing I asked, because it's brain cancer, I asked that she will remember me. And that took every little bit of grit and grind. I don't think I've ever delved so deep into my spirit as at that time. And you know what she said to me, Rick, when I, when I finally reached her, she ended up living three months, not three weeks, because she was waiting for me to get a permit to visit her, to travel to her through all the blockades. She took my hand. She couldn't hear anymore. She took my hand, and I would write on a little board when I was responding, and she would read, and she could still speak. But I reached her. God heard my prayer. I reached her before she passed away. Five days I spent with her day and night. And she still remembered me, which was a miracle. And she she took my hand and she really said, you know, Juanita, you've done so much in the ministry for other people and in the community. It's a new beginning for you. You need to do something that makes you happy. And after I conducted her funeral, because I was a pastor at the time, I drove back those nine hours. I walked up to, I have a mountain that I pray on because my nickname online is Lioness because of my fighting. But this rock, and I'll send you the photo, is shaped in the shape of a lion. And I sat on my lion rock and I cried for hours. You know, I fell asleep in the sun. I woke up and it all dawned on me. It all dawned on me. I had to climb that mountain. I had to sit on that rock because it dawned on me that that was my new beginning. I'd cried now about it. I'd put it behind me. It was what it was. You know, I couldn't change anything about it. But my new beginning, my new beginning was meticulous. My new beginning started. And I want to ask you, do you have a time that you can think back to where it felt like everything fell apart so that everything could fall together that you had a new beginning, and how did that impact you? Well, again, yes. Yeah, so, um, I've run several versions of um, Flashing Blades. Uh, you know, I've run different, different team names, different things, and I've worked on, on loads of low budget films over the years. And uh, again, I had one, um, and, and great, who uh, I won't mention any names, but she was. Um, Constantly moaning all the time about you know um, uh, not getting five hundred pound a day and and you 
you know, a, a recognition as, as being a stunt performer. She was quite happy to, to walk around and take photographs with herself and almost think I'm on set as a stunt performer with her. And uh, she has a, a simple task on set. And uh, uh, I told uh, now I teach that people get their own body pads, get, get their own um, uh, knee pads, elbow pads, and so that because they're yours. They, 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 they're your individuals. You can get hurt more by wearing stuff that don't fit you mm -hmm. than having your own. So, an armadillo, which is like a, like a big um, uh, snowboarding, it's, it's got uh, plastic pads here, plastic pads on the elbow, plastic pads on the shoulders. Basically, it gives you a, a section from front and rear, back mm -hmm. to the back, all sorts on it. So, but she didn't understand, or it's not because she didn't understand, but it's a case of, of um, I don't know why she why she didn't bother getting all stuff. Anyway, so she's performing the simple simple fight on, on, on a film, and she falls, gets hurt, and she starts blaming me for it. And saying, "Well, it's all my fault." And she goes, "Well, no, 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 no. I I I I told you from day one to get your own your own pads and your own kit, whatever." And then she goes through through the, the process of slagging me down to everyone on the film sets, um, you know, anywhere she went. She went to equity and, and tried shutting me down from equity and all that. Stuff. But I went really low from that from that point then because I thought myself, oh no, you know. And uh, I, 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 same as you, to sort of be, you know, I, I, I went off and I, I stopped doing it for a while. I stopped teaching and I stopped um, you know, working on films and all that sort of stuff. And um, same as you, I, I went off somewhere and I sat for, for many hours. And I, I'm a firm believer in the universe answers your prayers. Mm -hmm. Things happen for a reason, you know. And um, call it call it what you want. Call it call it um, in, um, you know uh, divine intervention or whatever. But something happened. Something happened for a reason. And this this is the thought from the head. Don't stop. Mm -hmm. So I quit for I think it was like, like a month or so, you know, and uh, you know for that, for, for, for that month, however. I was, you know, I was missing, I was missing what I'm doing, and I, I thought, and, and his voice kept in my head saying, you know, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. But I, I kept questioning that. But then the one morning I woke up and said, I said, I was starting again, you know. So that was then the start of, a, a, I think it was like a, a second incarnation of what I'm doing now. Yeah. And again, okay. something happened then. Uh, uh, in the third, so this is about the fourth incarnation of what I'm doing now. So I'm, I'm getting the same, the same sort of ideas from people within, within what I'm teaching now, but as I, 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 I bought thick skin now and I had to walk away from it now. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. That is so, so cool to know, you know. And it's speaking to someone in the audience right now, it is really stirring the heart of the people. There's, there's people that listen to this podcast that need to hear, like you said. The universe always makes things come together the way they are supposed to. Everything happens for a reason. I absolutely believe that. I see how the universe directs my steps. I see how the universe, you know, uses that energy that we put out there and reciprocates that energy. And what I get from you, Rick, my brother, is positive energy, is uplifting energy, is tenacity as an energy and perseverance. And that is streaming through what we are doing right now to the audience. So I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, upcoming projects or events that our meticulous moments audience can support you in, what are they going to be like? Well, I'm working on a, on a, on a couple things at the moment. I said I've got a um, stunt class now at the end, the end of, end of uh, January. Um, I've got a couple of films like that. I can't say the title of the film currently. But the one film is based on on um, uh, the myth of Merlin, and Merlin. Uh, there's a lot a lot of firework in it. So basically, uh, one of my skills about well, it is it, setting fire to things. Um, you know, like um, people, you know, swords and all sorts. So there's a, there's a um, well, this this film is called Burning Excalibur. I I was in the name of this film. It's called Burning Excalibur, and it's a uh, Basically, as I said, it, it, it's a story rather than King Arthur. It's a story of, of how Merlin develops his powers now, and how Merlin becomes Merlin as well. You know, and it's like uh, he goes through history and all of it, and, and you know, he, he's got a um, uh, burn uh, Excalibur, you know, in order to 
to make it pure in some moments of that, you know. So yeah, it's uh, that's one of the films. I'm so I, I'm also doing a, a lot of the choreography on it. And I'm also doing a lot of the um, advising on it as well because of, of my ro- Celtic stroke Roman stroke the dag age um, knowledge as such. They, they asked me to uh, advise on on some of the battle, the, some of the battle tactics, and, and some of the you know the fight scenes and what they would have done because they they don't want the Hollywood stuff. That, you know, they sort of, you know, the, um, how we think that a Dark Age Arthurian um, uh, battle would happen, you know, so and I'm trying to advise them as well, which is good, you know. So. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. It has been such a pleasure and an honor to spend time with you, Rick. You are an amazing person. Thank you for being my brother. And I want to ask you, as we close down this session, close off this session, do you have any words of encouragement or wisdom for the audience that you want to share? Yes. Um, keep going, uh, basically. It's, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I spent many hours being, being depressed, however, and uh, being upset by people, you know, mainly, and, 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 and their lack of um, uh, what's the word? Uh, thought for you know uh, lack of respect for people to a certain degree as well, and uh, respect has to be earned, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So you know, when you do some of the favor, that person sh- sh- should respect the fact that you've done that you've done a favor for them. And mm-hmm. so, so I said, I I I I've had people um, let me down through throughout my life, but just keep going. You know, just keep going because if you give up, they win. If it makes sense, you know. Yes. But by by keep going, you win. Um, true. Very, very, very true. And I also want to, you know, I want to relay your words also to the actors out there. I know we had a SAG strike for four months, probably six. And you know, keep going. Everything is going to normalize. Everything's going to pan out. And, uh, you know, just keep believing and just be ready. You know, when we believe and we are ready, then good things happen. And like you said, if we don't give up, we cannot fail. It has been a tremendous honor to have you here, Rick. And thank you so much for your importation. And God bless you always. The universe is always looking out for you. And we cheer you on. And I'm sure we are going to connect for more projects in the future. Thank you so much, Us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, 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 what is going on, everybody? Super excited to be here with you today. The name is David Fravlick, and I am the founder and president of New Beginnings Motivation, and we are super excited to announce that we are teaming up and coming alongside to be a sponsor for Meticulous Moments with Juanita Cap. This was an absolute joy to be able to come and to be able to be a sponsorship with her, not only because I believe in what she's doing and all the powerful moments that she's providing her community and the fact that she's invited me on her show a couple of times, but I'm also excited because she's a part of the family within the New Beginnings Motivation team. And it was a no-brainer when we had this conversation about teaming up with her. And so it is with an extreme honor that myself personally teaming up with Juanita Cap. So super excited and much love, sister. Hi, my name is Jose Escobar and I'm the founder and CEO of the Connected Leaders Academy. We're the number one fastest growing community and tribe of some of the highest level entrepreneurs all around the country and around the world. We're in 36 states across the U.S in 11 international countries and over 240 plus members growing every single day. And I'm honored, excited, and I'm, I'm glad to say that I'm proud to be the official sponsor of the Meticulous Moments podcast with Juanita Cap. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm excited for this journey.